rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be the glory for all the good things he's done in our lives. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Love you. Hey, the point of what is the purpose of any of that, right? If, I, I wouldn't put it down, but I'm saying is, what is our, Jimmy, like you said, what is our purpose? In our, what is the purpose of the ministry? What is the number one reason of the ministry? You know, if you're going to have this big sanctuary, if you're going to have this jets and all that stuff, what is your purpose? What is your calling? What are you trying to do, right? Are you reconciling, right? Isn't that the mission? To reconcile people to Christ? The reconciliation to Christ accomplished at the cross accomplished when we accept him as Lord, accomplished when we're born again. That's the cross. What happens after that? And that's what the manifestation of the kingdom should be in the earth. We have been reconciled to Christ through his shed blood. I mean, through the Father, to the Father by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The mentality that the Father had is yet to be evidenced through the body of Christ. Christ, Christ evidenced in the instance that he was selfless to the point that he gave all that he had in order to secure our soul. Or are we catching on to that vision that I should give all that I have in order to reach the soul or the benefit of another individual? Exactly. It's not about me. It's about God working through me to demonstrate to people that weren't there the love that was shed at the cross, that was evidenced at the cross. Self-sacrifice. That, I don't think we're going to be able to get around it. This is not something we're going to be able to say, oh, you know, I can sit up on this pillow and I'm brilliant or I'm rich and I can elevate myself above everybody else. Our, our skills, our wealth, our resources are actually for the uses of somebody else. Right. Well, you know what? It, it's to uplift other people. It's not, me, it's not so let, to us. Let me say this. I, um, and it's a concept, if you've studied history, you really understand as relates to as relates to history. And Miles Monroe, it was one of his major themes, colonization. And 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 I really, I really believe that to true because Jesus spoke about that his kingdom had come. Colonization is that you're 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 you know, thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You you want to reflect or begin to make look like Little Italy or Chinatown Amen. in America. Come on Amen. now. And and, and 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 that's colonization. In other words, that uh, there's Chinatown. And when you go down there, ain't no English. They got ducks hanging out the window. People are squatting on them on the sidewalks. I mean, you could it smells different down there. The buildings look different. The yep. people are dressed different. The people eat different foods. They behave different because they bought their country to where they are now and may wherever they are be a reflection of where they come from. I and I and I really believe that uh that is part of our mission, to be honest with you, because he said he came back to restore the kingdom, to bring the kingdom to earth. And he said that it is at hand. And he and he done brought it. And so now I think through colonization, we're supposed to be uh doing what we can to make this particular place that we are now be representative of our kingdom that we're from. Now, and, and if we do that, we're gonna discount we're gonna discard a major aspect of the American society. Capitalism. Hey, you know what? Capitalism and the kingdom of God do not. They, they can't. They don't run alongside each other. You can't reconcile them. Hey, hey, Elder. Uh, uh, but it's a good point, Jimmy. You made a good point. Let's use your analogy there. Now. The people in Chinatown uh, brought their culture to be implanted in where they're living. Right. In other words, you can. You get the same flavors and traditions that you get in China. I think, Bishop and Tim Kirk are wrong. What we want to do, though, is we don't give people a of what we're supposed to look like. Kids, don't come from Jimmy. Where? How many people? They didn't know what it's supposed to look like. Did they supposed to know? Did they know what the kingdom, living in the kingdom, and how? the life surrounding living in the kingdom looks like. Meaning moving from, really from dying to self to, to, to coming alive in Christ, right? 
I'm just saying is when you use your analogy of Chinatown, look what they did. They they really took they implanted something from somewhere else to where they live. So that you can get the different smells you're talking about. You'll get the different, you'll get you'll see the different signs and building and the complex. All kind of resemble where they came from. I think as we're preaching the gospel, right? <laughs> If we don't paint the picture of what it's supposed to look like, how are they going to understand how to build that? How do how do they expand the kingdom? Exactly right. Exactly right. So we're not. So that's what we need to be doing. Because I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to be Chinese, and you don't have to ever know any Chinese people, Come and on. you don't have to know nothing about China. Come but on. I'm going to tell you something. If I take you down there in Chinatown, uh -huh. you know you somewhere. You know you somewhere different. You know Come things on. are different. You know, you know what I'm saying? You see all them dragons that are carrying on and, and, and when you go, you know something just changed. Where are we at now? Cause this ain't this ain't like over there in little Italy. This ain't like over there in uh you know what I'm saying, some other aspect of a of a little other Irish town where the Irish folks at. This is totally different. Exactly. You know, and they will see, feel, smell, taste, touch, and understand the difference. And I think and I think that's uh I think that's what we're not conveying on exactly. a large scale. Exactly. And, and look, and, and if you think about it, Bishop says all the time, uh, you, you need to you need to move from death to life. And to move from death to life is to die to self. You, you, you have to move from, you have to die to this world way of thinking and acting to be born into the things of Christ in his image. And, and and Jimmy, uh, you don't mind? Uh, let me share this scripture with you. Could you share this for us? You can read it better, and you can comment as you go with it. But look at that one. Uh, this is, we still in Romans five. For those who are uh, looking at us live, we're in Romans chapter five, and uh, now we're at verse twelve and sixteen. And we're going to ask Jimmy to read that for us. Jimmy, you can comment on it as you go to obviously. Romans 5, 12 through 5, 16. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, men to be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not, it, not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was not by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. I mean, that's just beautiful scripture right there, if you can understand what it's saying. That is exactly. absolutely beautiful <laughs> scripture right there. Yes. That's beautiful scripture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, we really do want people to move from death to life. And and, and, and ministering, we need to show what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, you what know, too, I think it, it boils down to the understanding of knowing the significance of, 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 of the repercussions of the first Adam. Yeah. And the reversal of fortune, so to speak, of the last Adam how that one uh, failed and the other prevailed and overcame or overdid what the one had already put in place. Right. And so just understanding this is where it came from. This is why it happened because of one man yes. sin entered into the world because of that one man didn't all have sin. Yes. But, but, but don't get it twisted. There was also one that actually came in and reversed that same exact thing that to many offenses well, what were we all made righteous? On, so, man. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, and I, and I listen to some of the Hebrew Israelites and other folks, and they don't believe in original sin, and they don't believe in a lot of different things. And I, and I, I often question, 
what do they do with these scriptures? I mean, what do they do? How do they, how do they reconcile this out of the Bible? Because really, you don't need a whole lot of interpretation on that right there. That's pretty straightforward, plain English to me. <laughs> That's the whole point of it. They ignore them. They ignore but, I mean, them. but that's what I'm saying, though. So I like the analogy of the Chinatown. We need to make sure that we portray what this life, because you can be a rich man, and nobody has to stop somebody being rich. But a rich man in love is a difference between a rich man in selfishness. Right? The, you you being rich and you even if we think about this country where we grew, we talk about the the the, the atrocity of slavery, right? And and, and built a, I mean basically the thing about it is the atrocities for the pursuit of wealth or growth for this country. This country, when we look at our history, it's unfortunate when we look at our history. When you look at our history more, you know, we grew up in the culture of being teaching that we did some great things, being patriotic, right? We, we, we built a powerful industrial nation. But did we talk about how we got there? Yeah, and, and, and it always comes to the sacrifice of human life. And, and that is the greatest, to me, that's the greatest tale. I mean, when I say that's the greatest evidence, of the differences in the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Yeah. You, but you know, we God have to, now. I think we have it, to look at the God. definitions. I'm sorry, brother, go ahead. No, it, the, 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 you cannot serve God and mammon. Once mammon becomes your issue, then God is not, maybe not even in the picture at all, but definitely on the back burner. Human right. life is what, Jesus died for human souls. He didn't die for material profit or acquisition. Yeah. He died for people. So we look at the way that we do business. The thing that should be most, I mean, most, most, most uh, important to us should be the well-being of another in individual. Yeah. If we're really serving, if we're really serving according with the example that was given to us, Jesus sacrificed everything in order to acquire us a relationship with us, not our stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it was you know us that he was, he was going after. And that's the point, and that's the exact right point because. Here's the, here's the question. Now we're talking definitions because what is riches? What is wealth? Is it what the world has taught or is it what the scriptures teach? Is it hoarding that, that all resources and stockpiling which makes you rich or is it that giving and it shall be given unto you? Who's the richest? He that gives or he that hoards? I mean, so we have to look at the definitions. If we're following uh, this westernized definition of this world system of what riches and wealth is, we're going to get one definition. If we look to the scriptures and talk about what is riches, what is wealth, then I think we get a different definition. And so we right. just have to make sure that we're, because rich to who? I mean, what is rich? Based on what? Based on the scriptures or based on uh, capitalism? And, and, and that's the beauty of it, because right now the church and in, in the, in the culture are really should be conflicting. But we're trying to reconcile the culture with the church or the church with the culture and it ain't gonna work because uh -huh. capitalism is not a part of the kingdom of God. You cannot sell another person to make a profit or even use another person to make a profit. Uh -huh. You give up in order to edify that person, yeah. but you cannot, human life, human souls are not to be bought and sold. That's just not what we do for, and, and you talk about the evidence of, of, of what should happen in, a, in, our, in our regions. Uh, Chinatown is like this, but in the kingdom of God, we're not capitalizing off anybody's effort, if, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm not saying effort, but after their, of their usage, we're not. Slavery makes sense to me because of what's going on in our in our society right now. Yeah. Understand yeah. how we got there because we value money more than we do human life. We value hoarding more than we do disseminating. We value ourselves, ourselves more than we do other people. So right. we're like animals. That carnality, that carnal mind, that Darwinism play, is, 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 is evidence through what we're doing. And our society is trying to, I think, for lack of a better word, trying to, to reconcile Darwinism with the kingdom of God. And it, it don't work like that. It just doesn't. <laughs>
You can use it in business in the United States of America, but it doesn't work in the kingdom. Exactly. In other words, the kingdom way, look, look, I'm just trying to throw some in there. I mean, check this out. How do I accumulate wealth by the kingdom's way or how, how do we accumulate wealth by the world's way? Let me ask you this question. How do I define wealth? How do I define wealth by the kingdom's way or by the world's way? Exactly. <laughs> Well, well, I'm almost, I'm almost focused on the fact that it's not only defining the wealth, but how you got there. <laughs> I'm telling about the fact is that if you had to be brutal, if you had to be selfish, matter of fact, that that's matter of fact, the kingdom's wealth, the kingdom of God's wealth, is dying to self. The world's way is not dying to self, but dying, causing others to die for you. Now you're preaching. To get where you want. To. Right. That's the big difference. That way, I think that was what Bishop was talking about. He said, you got to die to self. You, you got to learn to move out of the way so that the God can have his way, right? You, you have to die to self. And this scripture, you know, when we're looking at that, Jim, in that scripture you was reading, it is talking about death and Adam, life in Christ. We have to die to ourselves. We, as those we're ministering to, as well as ourselves, is dying daily yourself and allow life to come through even jesus said that a, a seed can't grow unless it what it dies it falls in the ground yeah i mean it's everything isn't it yeah isn't it isn't it, isn't it natural i mean truly truly <laughs> but it's not it's, it's not i think westernization of the scriptures perverted them and this <laughs> is what we're living under a perverse uh 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 a manifestation of what the kingdom of God is. The United States of America does not evidence the kingdom that Christ preached. And unfortunately, we've tried to reconcile the two. There's no reconciliation in that. No. It does not teach selflessness. It teaches selfishness. It does not teach, you know, self-abasement. It teaches self-exhortation. Yes. It does not teach edifying and looking out. And the Bible itself tells us, be more concerned with the affairs of other people than you are concerned with the affairs of yourself. Exactly. So the love of God demonstrated through us should take on that guy more so than anything else. Yeah. And Vincent, get ready to say something. Vincent, while you say something, I'm going to give you a cord. My phone get ready to run out of power. Y'all go ahead. I'll, I'll read that. <laughs> Bishop is smiling way too much right now. Get ready to say something. <laughs> Go, Vincent. <laughs> you know, my mind is in a totally different place this morning. I, I was sitting here thinking, you know, last week we had a discussion about a man that brought his son to the disciples for deliverance, and they could not deliver him. And uh, I've been trying to figure out, you know, so how, how do I get in position so that I can be the best one of the instrument that God wants to, to bring in my deliverance? Because I think that their situation is no different from ours. They were engaged in a warfare against the powers of darkness. That is still true right now. We have been called into a warfare uh, against the powers of darkness for the purpose of furthering the kingdom. And at some point, we've got to recognize that if we are going to be successful, if we are going to be useful, there's some things that we need to get in place. Or well, otherwise, you know, we can have discussions and we can talk about some things. 
But when the rubber meets the road, you will be like those men. We'll, we'll learn what we need to do to avoid their failure. That's it. I answer the question. <laughs> where, where my mind goes is that, for the most part, what, what I have observed, and that's just self observation, is that when I find myself in situations where I have to employ this stuff, or a situation where I think I might have to employ it, I avoid that situation. And I find that for those, when you, when you say go beyond the conversation portion of it, the comfort zone is the conversation. The acquisition and the understanding is one thing. The implementation of it is totally different. And it's when we find ourselves in those circumstances that require that we do that. I think we, um, we through repetition, I think it, the more we find ourselves in those situations, we will actually yield to it. But eventually, but as a norm, we just avoid the situation period. And, 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 and I think that's what has happened. And, and while we saw the formation of the church, as it, it, as it was, as it, as it had been established up to this point, we were not willing to go out and get in the face of people who did not understand or did not comply with whatever standards we thought were godly or ungodly. We didn't do it and we avoided it. And when we were in other circumstances like jobs and homes from the behavior of other people, more so than our own, uh, and when I get in, got in an argument with my wife, where's the love, joy, and peace, and long suffering come in at that point? You know, where the selflessness and death to self comes in when I'm standing face to face with somebody that I got to take care of, but who just disagrees with what I'm saying. And, and those are those are kind of settings I think that we I habitually had kind of avoided. And even to now, even doing street ministry, there's an extent to which you want to go, and then you want to say, "Okay, this is where I'm going." Or uh, you need to take a bath, <laughs> you know, before I put you in my car, or one thing or another, you know. So I don't. I, I think that we are learning, but submitting to those circumstances that God allows us to enter into, or should allow, is not something that we're expert at yet. Most of us just avoid it. <laughs> I think we, I think we say that too often. I think we, we you know, I, I, I don't think we really uh, put the focus on the things that will really make a difference in the way we live. You know, I, I, I am, I am concentrating on discipleship because discipleship seems to be about application. It seems to be about, about just discussion. Discipleship is about becoming. And what, what, I, what, what I'm trying to I need in my life is I need to, I need to be addressing those things that provoke me to the application. I, you know, I don't want to have the discussion when it's all over, I, I shut the screen off and nothing changes. I want something that's going to follow me from this conversation into, into looking at what I do when I leave the screen, looking for and crying out and desiring that what I talked about <laughs> found expression in me. You see, it, 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 see, that text from last week, you know, I really kind of, it, it, not just that text, I find that in, in most texts, even the one that we looked at this morning, there is no real tearing into that thing to really get the essence of what 
to get you to a place where you can come and witness. And, and, and because he said, he told the apostles, and ye shall be my witnesses. I want you to preach the gospel, but the gospel is no good if it has no witness with it. They need to see what you're preaching. That they need to see it. They need to see somebody with it on on the runway and modeling it, so that they can, so that God can capture their heart and cause a fire to be ignited in their heart, saying, "I want that." Because when we see Jesus, when we read His life, there is something that cries out in me that says, "I want, I want that." And He is now calling us to be the means whereby that same kind of fire is kindled in men's heart when they see. When they see the beauty of holiness, when they see love at work, when they see the kind of compassion and the, and, and, the un, and the unworldliness and the beauty of His person being expressed to us, so it's not just it's not just one thing. It's a whole host of things that go into making the mission of Jesus and the kingdom work a reality. We got to be clear on that, that, part. that. I think that's that's it. There's a focal point, and that focal point is Christ. Everything points back to Him. So when I, to be a witness to me is more than just saying Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's a lifestyle that's submitted to his ordinances. It's a lifestyle that's committed to his direction, to his leadership. So I think in my son watching my life, he should have seen a man following Jesus Christ. He should have seen somebody obedient to him. And then from being obedient to Christ, you should see love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, meekness, you know, the fruits of the spirit should be evidenced in my life because I'm dedicated to this man, Jesus Christ. And that should be the conversation that my son has. That should be the witness that my son has from me. I'm saying though, if we are clear on the mission, if, listen, if we're unclear on the mission, then we will forever be rambling we need we need to be absolutely certain and clear <laughs> with that that can, there is no room for any ambiguity or uncertainty about what the mission is so that we we don't have to we don't have to keep going back and addressing the, the mission we know what the mission is i, I, I mean I, i'm hoping that in this in, after all these years of discussion we are clear what the mission is and we know those things that are directly and indirectly involved in the fulfillment of that mission. So, <laughs> but we don't. what do we need to do to cause the mission and the work to be realized? That, that, that's, that's the thing we need to get at now. The, the, the mission, in accordance with the man who initiated this, was to seek and to save that which was lost. He said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Our interaction with him should support that action. We can't seek to save anybody uh, in and of ourselves. We don't have the ability to save a soul, not one single soul. But we can witness it's him. We can we can do our roles to support his effort. His effort is to seeking to save every soul that we come in contact with, most probably, unless he gives us some other directive. Um so to lose sight for me to say and I, I have I, just as an analogy if i cannot show love to my wife i'm not supporting his effort because he dictates to me husband love your wife and be not bitter against him 